All right, first attempt at being a podcaster, YouTube, anything like this. Um, got some questions from the congregation, some within the congregation, some without, so we'll throw you the hardest one first. It might be the one. easiest. Would you rather be swallowed by a whale, be tossed into a lion's den, or fight Goliath? Oh, had more experience with Goliath. Okay. <laughs> the others I have no experience with at all. Don't know how you'd get out of a whale. Yeah. No. Digestive oh. juices, all that stuff doesn't sound No. Good. Um, all right. Next question. What is the most fulfilling aspect of being a pastor? Helping people. Sure. Helping people connect with Jesus. Helping people bring their lives back together after they've been through some pretty awful things sometimes. Yeah. Helping people. Yeah. How did you receive your call to ministry? That is, how did you know without a doubt? Was it like an instant? It was. So it was after a couple of things had happened first. And then on Christmas Eve on 1977, my pastor, it sounded like he was just talking to me. I was out in the crowd on a Sunday or a Christmas Eve service. And uh, it was like, he says, Don, it, it's time for you to make this decision. You, hmm. And we had talked before about laying this before the Lord and asking for doors to open and close. And boy, boy, that night I felt convicted that this is what I need to do. So two weeks later, I told my folks that I was considering to go to seminary. And I told them at Sunday dinner. Um, Monday, we were in classes at the college, and then uh, I had planned to go over and talk to him in the afternoon and tell him about my intent. And uh, he passed away that morning. Oof. And uh, evidently he figured it out because his widow had a place for me to sit at his funeral wow. of all the people that he had called to ministry, that had been called to ministry through his ministry. And he, she said, there's a seat up there for you. So somehow she knew. Uh -huh. And that actually opened the door for me to do a lot of the preaching, leading worship, uh, teaching in the congregation, in my home church, yeah. which solidified the call that I had that Christmas Eve. Wow, that's powerful. God kind of worked that for you. It was almost got pushed towards it, it seems like. But got pushed, yeah. Wow, wow. I mean, we're lucky to have you for that. Definitely was well, a good call. Well, that's one of the reasons that I say that if you're considering ministry, you need to have a dramatic, a, a definite, without a doubt call in order to go into ministry because it's not exactly the easiest work in the world. Sure. Uh, it's, it's not like laying siding or something like that. That's hard work too. But this is a work where, where you're, you're wrestling with people's lives and their hearts and their attitudes and <laughs> sometimes their... Uh, their, their ways of doing things are different than we would. Yeah. And given the, uh, the cultural climate changing so rapidly, uh, that adds another aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And in order to be sensitive to people, you're always uh, having to be intuitive to what, what's going on uh, between people. So it's a high level of uh, sensitivity intuition and is that something that you like developed and the, and like the, the Holy sensitivity Spirit. to it just be able to pick up on that stuff or it, yeah that's catered okay. over time that's been cultivated over time mm -hmm. uh, i did a lot of studying in addition to that uh family systems okay and so you get a little bit more of a sense uh with with that kind of education interesting cool okay when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Architect. Architect. Okay. I was going to be an architect. I was going to build wonderful buildings. Did you draw like drafting different yeah. stuff when you were younger? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever build any of them? Nope. Nope. Okay. Well, I guess I did. Down in Mediapolis, there's a building that I built out of concrete block. It's two story. It's a three car garage and a workshop on the first level. And then the second level is a, a meeting room and a bathroom and a storage room. So I guess I have built something. And it's still standing. Last I heard. Oh, that's good. Yeah, last I heard. Great. All right. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Vanilla. I'm sorry I'm not exciting, you know, 
to vanilla. You can see the disappointment in my I eyes. Know, I know, I <laughs> know. Now, if I if I really like to spice it up, then I like dark chocolate syrup. Okay, okay. We can we can agree dark, on that. Not one. just That's, chocolate. No, dark, dark chocolate. chocolate. Yeah, you want yeah. that bitterness in there a little mm. bit. That's good. Okay. Should we forgive the devil ever? Well, I don't think we're going to be given that opportunity. That's sort of God's thing. Uh, interesting that the devil is called the uh, the advocate. He, he's the uh, not advocate, but the uh, tempter, accuser, accuser. And sometimes we need the accuser to mm-hmm. keep us sharp. So do we forget forgive the devil? Well. I don't think we'll have that opportunity. God's going to take care of that piece. I think we need to acknowledge that uh, even in the midst of all of God's creation, even he serves a purpose. I mean, Judas even had a purpose. Sure. Uh, we didn't like his purpose. Mm-hmm. And we didn't like the outcome. But even so, we wouldn't have the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ without the death. Sure. A lot of times we would not have the uh, benefits of knowledge without the trial. Right. Uh, I, in school, would you commit to memory those things without a challenge to do so? Mm-hmm. So even even Satan has purpose. Sure. It's kind of like when your parents not tell you not to do something, but you're going to go ahead and touch that stove anyways, because yeah. I know that's how I learned. Very close parallel to an apple. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. Uh, favorite pizza toppings. Oh, see, I, I like the meat lovers. Meat lovers. So sausage and pepperoni. You bet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a farmer, so I appreciate that. Does, does fruit belong on pizza? I like the Hawaiian. Okay. Yeah, that's, I that's do. my go-to, but yeah. generally it's, uh. I do like the Hawaiian. What is it? Hawaiian Delight, they have a, uh, pizza ranch. Oh, yeah. I think all of them have some kind of a rendition. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. Some kind of Hawaiian thing. Yeah. Not pineapple. Yeah. Just don't get carried away with vegetables. Okay. Okay. Um, what's the best way to approach, say, like a friend or like an acquaintance that you know is a non believer to someone who's not necessarily open about their faith? Like everyone knows they're Christian knows they go to church, but they don't talk about it a lot. How does that person approach the non-believer to, um, you know, do God's work in their lives? Right. And I found the best is to be really listening for a place you can pick up with a question. So usually, if they know you're a Christian, there's Mm -hmm. going to be times when they're going to come up with a comment or something maybe a little dig and you can say so well so what do you think about that you know they talk about well and you you talk about your god and I, so what do you talk about mm-hmm. bring it up as a question so that they are drawn into the conversation by the need to give some kind of answer or mm-hmm. some kind of response uh first peter uh, three fifteen, i think t- tells us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in christ jesus I, I think we can give answers, but I also think in this generation, asking some questions actually gets us farther to get a, a place to share the gospel. Sure. Uh, inquiring minds want to know. You know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's one way to get them to inquire. Yeah. Is to ask them questions. And it's then they, in turn, hearing a good answer, you know, and back and forth. Right. creates dialogue. Part of what I think in this generation, we're afraid of the dialogue. Because once you start the dialogue, then then what do you do? Mm-hmm. And there's sort of a temptation to say, well, if you don't believe exactly like I do, then I really don't have to do anything with you or be a part of you. Or sure. We need to s- separate and spend less time together. Mm-hmm. I don't like that at all. In mm-hmm. fact, I think some of the most fruitful discussions I've ever had were with those who were 180 degrees different than I. Uh, on a, in a situation where we're talking about human sexuality, found out that uh, there were uh, uh, 
to uh, same-sex individuals who actually believed the same thing I did about something else, but had we not had the conversation, we wouldn't have entered even into a discussion about it. Sure. And uh, I appreciated what they had to say. Yeah. So it really changed the conversation altogether. Interesting. How did that conversation end? Or like, was there a just kind of a, well, we both disagree on the, or we, we agree to disagree kind of a thing? We agree to disagree on that one piece, and then we praise the Lord on the pace, places that we agree. Cool. So, it, you know, I think more of us maybe could practice that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I definitely have plenty of friends like that where it's, yep, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that one, but then sometimes that's even just a little foothold to, like, well, what about, you know, later on, they say, you know, what about you, what you said about this? Is that still what you think? And then, then you can, you know, get to def- have to defend yourself a little bit sometimes. But then also it's a another way for them to ask questions because a lot of times that's how it starts is a little bit of ribbon criticism of it. And that turns to questions. And Exactly. And that's, that's where I'm saying then you can ask the question back once in a while. So yeah. if you do this here, how about this here? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you're right on. So I know that you're going to have to take off soon. Uh, so the last question and this one, so I, I emailed everybody in the congregation, you know, like, you know, send me some questions. Um, I had a lot of people send some of the same questions, which I thought was interesting. But one of the favorite ones is like, what would it take to keep you as a pastor here for a just longer than just the summer? Oh, wow. Well, there's two pieces. Uh, a call. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've already felt the call to to at least do this summer, a- and somehow to make a living. Yeah, that really does help mm-hmm. make ends meet. Um, but great, great people here. I know. I know. It, it, my heart has always been wanting to rekindle the fire in the rural church. Yeah, because because the city church has grown so much, they seem to get all the resources that uh, they ever need, yeah. including personnel. But the rural church, uh, let's face it, that's where the heart of this nation is. I mean, the, the uh, stalwart of, of this nation is still in the rural communities. Uh, people who tend the soil and, and uh, tend to livestock see life much more broadly than somebody who's in the city and buys their things at the grocery store. They are able to see God at work in all of creation, weather even, and uh, that creates a much stronger faith than someone who's spoon-fed mm-hmm. in the city. So I, I believe highly in the rural church. Yeah, I mean, you didn't like ever. Did you ever like? Were you ever at a city church kind of a thing? Well, Castle was Castle was in Elkhart. Yeah, you know, really, I haven't ever been in an inner city church and yeah. pastored. Really have no desire to live in, in a big city. <laughs> Kelowna's plenty big enough. Yeah, I agree. Just uh, isn't my style. Uh huh. I'm a farm boy. Yep. Oh, me too. That's uh, a lot of fun out on the farm for sure. Um, Give me a tractor. Let me drive. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's what my son always says too. He just wants to be on the wheels doesn't care i sure he'll be mowing soon so um anything else to add as far as what you're looking to maybe do uh branching out here you know something that whoever would be watching would say you know you know what should we do to now that we have someone who's really you know strong and uh ambitious to you know the rural church how can we help network the okay. biggest thing that we can do right now is that if we, if we consider ourselves an asset to the community as a church, a spiritual asset to this community, let's share the asset and make sure that everybody knows something's going on here and invite them to it. Uh, let them know that uh, it, we're, we're focusing on the essentials, highlighting the essentials of our Christian faith, minimizing our differences as much as we possibly can so that we're drawn together to worship Jesus, bring glory to Almighty God, and sense a presence of his Holy Spirit moving right here. Mm-hmm. Awesome. 
Okay, on that note, we'll end it. I'm sure we'll have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, email link pop up and if you want to send any more questions in or anything like that to ask sure. uh, Don, and we'll do this again sometime yeah. soon. We could have a Thursday morning with Don and Alex. Hey, yeah, there you go. We'll have to get some, Don. like, coffee or Maybe donuts Alex or something. Don. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like good. That. Yeah. Coffee. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's coffee. I could bring donuts. Okay, sounds good. All right, Next. until next time. Thanks. Thank you, Alex.